Hi, everyone, and welcome to our special board meeting on May 30th, 2022, scheduled for four o'clock. And unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, we've had to bump it back just a bit. So I'm calling the meeting to order at 417. Um, is there any emergent changes to the agenda? That's our item B. The recommendation is that the May 30th, 2022 special board meeting agenda be approved. Uh, by the Board of Trustees as presented or amended. Can I get someone to make that motion? Uh, Trustee Long? Oh, and then does anyone have any emergent changes that need to go on the agenda at this time? I'm not seeing any hands. If you are having difficulty and you just wanna unmute yourself and let me know. Three, two, one. Okay. So all in favor of approving the agenda as it is presented. Um, okay, perfect. Sorry, next time I'll call for any opposed. Are there any opposed? No, perfect. Okay, uh, moving on to item C, uh, declaration of conflict of interest. Uh, that the Board of Trustees declare if they have any conflicts of interest relating to agenda items from the May 30th, 2022 special board meeting. And if so, please declare them now. Is there anyone who needs to declare a conflict of interest? Seeing none, we will move on to item D, our action item. The 2022-2023 budget report from Livingston Range School Division uh, that will be presented by Mr. Jeff Perry. Um, the 2022-2023 Livingston Range School Division budget report is to be approved by the Board of Trustees and submitted to Alberta Education by May 31st, 2022. Mr. Jeff Perry, Associate Superintendent of Business Services, will review the proposed budget for the board's approval. The recommendation is that the 2022-2023 budget for the Livingston Range School Division approved by the Board of Trustees for submission be approved by the Board of Trustees for submission to the Alberta Education um, is there someone who I can get to make that motion? Trustee Yegos. Okay, perfect. And Trustee Yegos, did you want to speak to it or turn it over to Mr. Perry at this time? Turn it over to Mr. Perry. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, if anyone's having any issues with like their internet, we're going to need, um, Mr. Perry's going to be sharing his screen. And so if you would like to turn off your camera, you can at this time, and I will be watching for if you need to put your hand up, um, little emoji. Lori, maybe when you get a minute, if you wanna um, turn your camera off, your wheel turning is distracting. <laughs> so when it's safe for you to do so. Okay, Mr. Perry, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Well, this day has been a long time coming. There's lots of moving parts with this uh, budget. And uh, so um, I will take you through the budget. I have a um, slide presentation that I will go through. Um, I also have up on my other screen, uh, the budget report. So uh, feel free to ask any questions throughout the uh, uh, presentation, um, or I'm happy to answer any at the end of the, the presentation as well. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. And uh, just, I will make the assumption that everyone can see the screen because it says that I'm sharing. So we can see it. Okay, thank you. Alrighty, so today is May 30th, 2022. Uh, this is our board budget meeting. Um, I have uh, an outline that I'm gonna go through. Basically, the slides will take us through the um, budget report document, uh, but certainly, um, like I said, if you have any questions on the budget report itself, um, I did just send out a revised version just recently. Uh, some changes from the original one that was sent out a little bit earlier. Um, but uh, if you have questions on the budget report, I can jump to that as well. But I'll go through this slide presentation. The budget highlights 
plans and assumptions is the second document in the budget report. And so the information that I've put on there um, will go through as well. Um, the, uh, and there's different aspects of, of what's included in that. So uh, we'll talk about uh, the changes to the revenue, significant costs accounted for, um, staffing considerations, enrollment changes, divisional priorities, the impact on individual budgets, review of expenditures, and obviously the operating uh, reserves impact. And then we'll talk about a few risks that are associated with uh, um, beyond the budget, uh, what uh, may not be taken into consideration. So there's areas of uncertainty, procurement challenges, and uh, future funding uncertainty as well. So, and then <clears throat> we can review any uh, areas on the statements that you would like. So, okay, you've seen this before. I thought uh, as far as the uh, first um, highlight and, and assumptions, uh, we'll go through quickly the uh, revenue side of things and what's changed in, in revenue from one year to the other. And so this is a document or a uh, um, table that identifies based on the announcement that the government provided on funding for the 2022-23 year, there was rate increases um, that affected base uh, um, uh, funding as well as uh, POM, which is plant operation and maintenance and transportation. Then there's our WMA increase. So uh, we'll talk about a little bit later how uh, we projected to have more students next year than we have had in the current year and, and in the previous year, and what impact does that have on WMA? And uh, I know we'll, we'll talk about WMA in a, another meeting in more detail, but uh, uh, what impact does it have this year? So uh, when we break out the funding that we received, and we know what the funding is from uh, the provincial government as of uh, March, and so that funding uh, likely won't change unless there's significant uh, uh, differences in our WMA, and then we have to account for that in, in the year that we're in. Uh, but going forward, we look at uh, the funding that we're receiving, anticipating that our uh, enrollment projections are right on, and uh, we can anticipate that, that would be the funding that we would have in the fall for the school year. So when we look at the rate increases, uh, base instruction, uh, based on the rate increase, we will receive $216,000 more, Based on the WMA increase, uh, we will receive $866,000 more. Um, likewise, in services and supports, which is where our learning uh, supports area is, so um, students with uh, special needs as well as ESL or uh, those types of areas, um, there was no rate increases there, but there was a slight uh, change um, impact from uh, other areas, so $4,000 decrease in that area, as well as WMA in decrease of 468. So um, one of the main reasons why this area went down was because um, our WMA. Jeff, our, yep. can you just let everyone know what WMA is? It's the, it's the way that uh, the government um, takes our enrollment and they put it into a weighted, weighted moving average. So it's based over three years. And so our projections for next year um, are considered for 50% of the funding. Uh, the current year that we're in, um, the actual results is 30% and the year before that is 20%. So when you say WMA, there's a calculation to take those proportions into account. And so if you grow significantly in one year that the revenue um, is slow to respond, but likewise, if you decline in enrollment, the revenue is likewise to be slow to respond as well, meaning that um, it's over a three-year time period that you lose that, that uh, revenue or gain that revenue. Okay, so learning supports is down in almost about $470,000. Uh, plant operation and maintenance, transportation is an increase of $201,000 um, with the WMA impacting that to increase uh, slightly uh, in the POM area of 20. 1,783. Um, community uh, grants um, is an increase of 78,000. There was no rate increases, but based on WMA increases, that increases by about 78,000. 
and then we get down to the summary of those. So before bridge and mitigation, COVID mitigation funding um, increases or decreased, we have uh, about nine, just over $900,000. Then our funding was decreased, uh, bridge funding and COVID mitigation funding was decreased by 650,000. Our First Nation funding was increased by about 18. And so the net of that is about $279,000. There was a over $200,000 decrease to our uh, capital maintenance renewal, but that is for facilities. So uh, when you look at it overall, there's a slight increase overall to the funding we will receive next year. However, when you look at it from, and don't take into account, account capital, maintenance, capital maintenance renewal funding, um, we're about 279,000 to the positive. Um, one of the challenges is that in, you can see that uh, um, the increases uh, for some of these areas um, are not instruction. And so the increases for those areas is about $447,000. So net to instruction is actually a decrease of 168,000. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We we back up one second, please. Yeah. Brief slide. So, why why on our weighted moving average are we down so much in services and supports? Sorry, say that again. In so, in our services and supports. Yeah. On our weighted moving average, we're yeah. we're down four hundred sixty eight thousand. Right. Yeah. Uh, can, can you explain that a little more? Yeah, the majority of this decrease is in our PUF program. So uh, there's a requirement for a certain amount of hours. There's a requirement for um, the number of uh, students. And uh, for the last couple of years, we have not been uh, at the level as to what we anticipated um, based on hours. So it moves us down on the WMA. and so. Um, that uh, uh, area has received significantly less inst instructional dollars or funding for it. Um, yeah, Lisa would be able to explain that a little bit better, but uh, the WMA for the number of PUF students has decreased. So meaning that we likely projected higher than what we actually received in that area. And so it has a negative impact and uh, uh, projections going forward into this year were down from um, what we had projected in the past as well. So it results in a, a negative $200,000 there. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Okay, my slides are pretty big here and so, okay. So changes to revenue, there are other areas. Um, so change from 2021 on your budget report, it compares it to um, the previous year's budget as well as 2021 uh, actual. And uh, the change in that area is, um, so it's, it's a reduction into this year for Alberta government revenues, but in 2021, um, there was uh, other funding that we received that uh, um, was uh, not received in this year. So that was the year of the um, return to school, return safe, safe return to school funding, the, also the, um, uh, the worker benefit that the government paid out that was put through schools and so forth. Um, there's also uh, Alberta government decline in, in fees, activity fees and extracurricular in that area. And there's increases in sales in the international programming. Our programming is um, last year was significant or the current year that we're in was significantly higher than what we had budgeted. We anticipate it to be at the same level. So there's a, an increase to that as well. Um, just a second. Can you see it like that? Are you guys good to read that or is it too small? No, it's good. Okay, we're gonna leave it at that then.
Um, I see it, everybody can. Great. Okay, so just I'm I'm going through the the budget report and the changes to the revenue. So um, when I look at uh, the report, it identifies that there is an increase in sales and services. And so I was just identifying what the areas of increase were. So international programming, I already mentioned that as to why preschool programming, we have three preschools now. Um, it wasn't in the previous budget because um, that was startup this year it is. And so there's a higher amount than it was in the previous years. And I included uh, Livingston Ski Academy in that number as well, which results in uh, um, the increases. Um, <clears throat> for sales and services, the one main decrease in that area was uh, cafeteria sales. And I think from the last two years with COVID, the sales have been down somewhat. Uh, so the schools have budgeted down. Uh, that may or may not be the case. They may may uh, um, result in higher um, revenue in that area, but typically if there's higher revenue, there's higher costs as well. So fees um, is significantly down and I'm not quite sure why schools have uh, uh, budgeted for lower activity fees at this point, but in this area, uh, it was down from the previous year. Sorry, just one sec, Jeff. Does anyone have a question? I just see, Brad, that your hand is up, but I didn't know if that was still up as an accent or I, go ahead. I can it. lower it. It, it, was from, it was from earlier, but uh, okay, sorry about that. conversation's passed. No, it's fine. Okay, sorry for interrupting, Jeff. I just didn't want to miss that. No, that's fine. Okay. Okay, so overall, our revenue from the previous budget is uh, up by about $200,000. And uh, um, most of that is falls into the sales and services area. Um, as I identified before, there's not a, a real increase or decrease from uh, uh, the Alberta Education Funding. First Nation funding was up slightly. Uh, we have similar amount of students. The rate is anticipated to be similar. And so there wasn't a large increase. So. The increases basically come from international program, preschool, and, and uh, the ski academy was also in there, but I included that in a uh, uh, different area to, that uh, wasn't included there last time. Um, any questions about revenue based on what you've seen in your budget report and what I've just shared with you? If not, carry on. So one, the next uh, area is the uh, expenditures and the majority of the expenditures in the uh, division is uh, staffing. Um, the, uh, there is a sheet at the very back of your budget report that identifies staffing and the changes there. So this, this slide will go through that, that document. Um, certificated staffing are up three from the prior year's start. Uh, most, of, most of that is due to enrollment increase. So um, I'll talk about enrollment in a second, but uh, those three staff members are, are um, due to that. They were added in the prior year or in the current year that we're at. And so when we talk about maintaining staffing levels, that, that is what we're doing. Um, we're down from 2021 when we had received, like I said, that federal funding for safe return to school. And so we had additional staffing that was hired throughout that year to ensure um, we could uh, accommodate the high demand for um, uh, at home or virtual, virtual schooling. As far as the support staff, um, during the 2021-22 school year, additional staff, mostly in the area of learning support, uh, were added and maintained in the current year. So. Um, this budget, when you look at the numbers for support staff, will identify that we're significantly up. Uh, many of those staff were added during this year and they're being maintained and, and some added to um, the current school year. And the biggest thing is the increases in the areas of educational assistance, child youth care workers, and a slight increase to family school liaison counselors. It identifies the um, growing need 
in the uh, learning support area. And I know uh, Lisa has mentioned, regardless of the amount of funds that we get, we have an obligation to support those students and have it help them be successful. And so uh, focusing on supporting these areas and, and the number of staff in this area um, is important and has been part of the planning for this budget. There is a, a sheet for enrollment as well. Um, really the, the biggest point of that sheet is that we're up about 85 students grades one to 12. Um, in all the other areas, we're pretty much the same as the prior year. So very close in the home education amount of students. First Nations uh, from living on reserve and attending our schools is very similar and we've planned for the same amount of students for international, which was about 48, 47 and a half FTE students, international students this year. Um, how does that impact uh, our WMA? Like I indicated before, 50% of that 85 additional students um, is taken into consideration in WMA funding. So the funding um, that we're receiving um, has increased and you've seen where uh, the WMA increased the, the provincial funding. And that's based on 50% of that 85, uh, that growth of 85 students. It also could mean that the year that drops off um, was a, a lower year. And so we, the three year average uh, using the 20, 30 and 50 um, rates um, has a tendency to, to grow as well. So it's 50% of the 85 plus a little bit from a, a lower enrollment year dropping off. So when we took into consideration the um, this budget, we looked at what the priorities of the board were and uh, culture, academics and leadership. So every school deserves a winning culture. Every student can succeed and everyone can be a leader. Um, the question is asked, how does this budget support these board priorities? And the board identifies areas of commitment within those uh, three priorities and in each of the in each of the above areas and there is funding in place to continue to support these commitments um, where required it should say required not request there also having the staffing in place to support schools in these areas is also a priority of this budget we also extended that question how do we continue to support the schools what are your main priorities uh, we asked administrators what their priorities were and uh, their response was staffing, staffing, staffing. So um, with growth of around 85 FTE students, um, the uh, uh, level of staffing was a, a high priority for the administrators out of the school. Um, and like I said before, we added a lot of instructional and learning support staff to meet the needs of students. And this budget maintains um, the learning support staff to meet the needs of those students in the 2022-23 year. Um, the budget also maintains the current staffing levels um, divisionally. So the other thing that they, they asked was to maintain divisional supports. And so um, <clears throat> the staffing levels at the divisional level are also maintained uh, as well as the um, supports in place to um, support the schools and, and in those areas. Um, this includes um, the continuation of the uh, virtual school and the investment in place-based programming as well. And uh, so we haven't reduced any uh, programming um, for the current year. Um, we'll talk about what the impact on the bottom line is, but this budget takes all that into account that we're maintaining the staffing levels. Um, we're also uh, maintaining the supports and the programs that have been put in place. Now, with costs rising, with costs rising and uh, revenue staying status quo, for the most part, um, some things have to give. And so we looked at all other types of budgets that weren't staffing to see what we could uh, um, accommodate to support maintaining those staffing levels. And so here's some of the decisions that were made. 
uh, the schools for student allocation rates to schools were reduced by one third. Um, this is the non-staffing component of their budgets, um, supplies, uh, services, things of that nature. Um, and also international allocations that had formerly been allocated out to schools are being held back and will be evaluated on a go forward, go forward basis um, as we monitor uh, the budgets going forward. So non-school operational budgets also have been reduced in the areas of PD travel supplies, um, which is likely where schools will have uh, reduced as well. Um, and all budgets over the last few years have not been entirely spent. And so we felt that there was some um, fluctuations that could be absorbed within those budgets uh, to allow for continued uh, uh, support for schools, as well as other de departments' budgets, and uh, that uh, we would still be okay in that area. Um, by putting resources into staffing and reducing operational dollars, this should li likely not be the case going forward, meaning that um, there likely won't be surpluses uh, going forward in those areas, which is where we want to really get to. We want to use the dollars for today on the students today and, and not grow dollars unless we have a plan to do so. Okay. So the budget report also identifies um, the ups and downs in our expenditures. So we talked about revenue, we talked about um, enrollment and staffing, we talked about um, looking at the priorities. And so now we, we look at the revenues or the expenditures side of things and, and analyze uh, the changes and, and what's occurred in there. So uh, the first area is uh, um, certificated staffing. So certificated staffing has increased um, from the current year uh, and, and the prior year. Um, we talked about uh, additional staff um, certificated staff of three. We also talked, or we haven't talked about the average cost of a teacher actually went down, but the average cost of benefits increased significantly. Um, so in addition to this, we do have some indication of what the increases will be for certificated staffing. The process that uh, uh, TIBA and uh, uh, divisions are going through is the potential ratification of that. Um, central bargaining uh, settlement. Right now they're getting feedback on that. It hasn't been ratified up to this point. However, um, that has that uh, potential settlement, settlement has been taken into consideration in this budget. Likewise, support staff salaries, additional EAs, CYCWs, uh, and FSL uh, time have increased uh, from the prior year, beginning of the prior year. And so those, those uh, areas of the budget have increased. And we also have taken into account um, the potential settlements as we will be negotiating with uh, other uh, support staff groups. And, and uh, this has been taken into consideration in this budget. Other areas um, are the benefits. And so ATRF is just an in and an out. It's actually, we don't actually receive the dollars, but there's an increase to that uh, revenue and then to the expenditure of about $250,000. Um, significant increases to ASCBP benefits, which is our benefit provider. Uh, about 7.85% is the increase this year. Um, for teachers, that's significant. It's over $1,200 increase in, in per teacher um, based on, on these increases. Um, from what we had budgeted before. So we had under budgeted before and uh, so the increase is significant. Uh, CPP and EI is also increased by 10 and a half and 7.1% respectively. And uh, this budget also takes into account a decision that was made uh, earlier uh, um, in the area of pension and the change in policy adds uh, additional costs and support for some support staff in this area as well. By services, contract, and supplies, here's the major areas as to where we saw significant differences. Um, there were significant cost increases in utilities, in insurance, in fuel, uh, and our international program, but that was offset by additional revenue that we budgeted. So um, there are some decreases. 
um, school generated fund activities, which is in an in and an out uh, amount, but it's more in line with what we've experienced over the last couple of years, recognizing that COVID uh, may have decreased those areas, but uh, this is a in and out expenditure. So the revenue and the expenditure both go down by $435,000. The FACES program, changes to the FACES program. It's not as many days as we anticipated originally. Um, we've, uh, so this is, as we don't have as significant of a cost to uh, run the program for the days that we do. So that's decreased by about $265,000. Um, in the current year, we, received less or had less students that were living off reserve attending on reserve and so the tuition in that area is down by about 144,000. Supplies is an area where schools and departments uh, have reduced to the tune of about $277,000. PD has be, been realigned with uh, the opportunity to take more online and so there's about an $80,000 decrease in there and travel and subsistence about $40,000. So those are the areas of significant um, changes uh, from the previous year's budget to, to this year's budget. Is there any questions about expenditures before I move on that uh, anybody wanted to highlight or ask? I was just wondering, Mr. Perry, how many teachers approximately do we have in our division? Just teachers. Yeah, so we have about 214 teachers listed on that, sorry, that's FTE. So when you look at the number of teachers, we typically have between 220 to 230 actual teachers. Filling but, 214 but, FTEs? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's about what we have. So okay. there is, there is that, that information, let's, let me validate that. The very last page, I think page 10, is projected staffing statistics. Um, so I guess when I gave you that information, there's actually 216 teachers that are supporting schools. So that would be in schools and in uh, um, pursuits and, and so forth. Um, there's five non-school based teachers. So your superintendent, uh, the two associate superintendents, your director and the other supervisor, they're the individuals that are not directly in the school, they are uh, non-school based. And so that results in about 221 FTE of teachers. Okay. You can see that for support staff as well, how they're broken out. It identifies education. It breaks them out into different areas like educational assistance and then other non-certificated instructional uh, staffing. Then it breaks it out into maintenance, transportation, um, and then other which is what some of us fall into, others. Okay, yeah. perfect, sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Uh, Trustee Hodges. I just have a question around FACES. What's the expenditure for the FACES? Because typically doesn't it just support itself and, and generating? I, I just wondered what the expenditure was for that, so sorry. So I'm not quite sure I understand. So the expenditure for FACES is that we, uh, have uh, numerous types of expenditures. So we actually hire the teachers that will teach and be the lead oh, yeah, teachers right. of FACES. So, um, but we also contract the FACES Education Corp um, to facilitate all the other events that go around it. So we pay for the lead teacher, they pay for all the other activities, the food, um, the housing, all that, that uh, stuff. So the transportation of getting students here and there, and then they have a significant costs in training and those types of things. So we pay a uh, uh, contract, a negotiated contract amount for that area. But so when I say FACES program costs were reduced by 265,000, I'm saying what we would have budgeted last year, it's lower than what we had going forward than what we budgeted last year. Yeah, sorry, I was just, I, that was me being confused on it for a minute there, but thank you for just clarifying it. Thanks. Yep, no problem. Thanks, Trustee Hodges. Is there any other trustees who have questions before we move on to the expenditure portion? If you think of one later, you can still jump back with it, but okay, I'm not seeing any hands, so go ahead, Mr. Perry. Okay, I'm going to jump into the operating reserve impact from this budget. Um, so 
the this budget is projecting a one point nine five six two hundred thirty eight thousand dollar. Let me say that again: one million nine hundred and fifty six thousand two hundred thirty eight dollar deficit. Okay. So the things that I've provided to you in advance of this with regards to the explanation of staffing, the explanation of increase and decrease on cost, the um, fluctuations in revenue all lead to, uh, and then and as well as the maintaining current level staffing all lead to uh, this, this deficit. So I thought it's important to identify how this impacts our current operating reserves and uh, what it looks like going forward. So currently at the end of August 31st, 2021, which is our last audited financial statements, we had um, three point, just over $3.7 million in operating reserves, which is about 7.2% two, two, of our operating expenditures. Um, the anticipated, one of the things that we have to do is we have to anticipate where we're going to end in the current year. And so it is anticipated that we will have a deficit of around $514,510. And uh, so that, if that is where we end in the current year, that would reduce that $3.7 million in operating reserves down to $3.225 million in operating reserves, which is about a 5.79% uh, of operating expenditures level. Um, this this year, the budget uh, moving forward, um, we are eligible to maintain the same level of reserves as what our uh, percentages for admin. Uh, it's the same calculation. And so when you look at that, it's 4.38 is what the provincial government identifies at this point that we are able to hold in uh, um, operating reserves, which means at the end of next year, at the end of this budget that we're that we're presenting at this point, um, we need to be within 2.4389. Now that is based on, um, it, it'll actually be based on what our uh, reserves are at the end of the day this year. Um, so that could fluctuate a little bit. It could be 4.38% of a, a different number depending on where our expenditures end up. Uh, but that thereabouts, that's the level that we're eligible to have. So this budget, will reduce um, our reserves by $1.935 million, which would leave the division at $1.3 million remaining, which is well within the allowable reserve level. Um, this budget takes into consideration that there is no funding being provided on top of what we're receiving or the, what we know about at this point, meaning that um, if there is additional funds for settlements in the future, that has not been taken into consideration at this, in this budget. And so um, that's where we have projected to land with regards to this budget and our operating reserves. Um, the minimum operating reserve requirement is 556,000. So we're well above that still at this time. So any questions about the operating reserve impact and based on this budget? Finally, I'll get into some of the areas of significant business and financial risks. Um, there's still a continued impact of the pandemic and cost uncertainty. Um, from utilities and uh, fuel, you can see costs continue to rise. Um, it, costs continue to rise to get products and services. And in some cases, we have the inability to procure things such as buses, mechanical and electrical parts supplies and equipment. So at this point in time, we still have not been able to procure buses to replace um, some of the ones. Typically every year we drop some buses off, those that are uh, older and uh, needing more uh, maintenance and replace those with uh, either uh, good used or, or new. And uh, it's been challenging even to this point of time to uh, get those buses. Um, we're also experiencing mechanical and electrical um, shortages and challenging times in getting those types of parts as well. So, uh, and supplies and equipment. So there's a risk that it could impact our uh, operations going forward, but it also could impact 
this budget and meaning that costs could continue to rise, fuel could continue to rise, uh, and, and timelines as well could be uh, increased. Um, uncertainty around staffing settlements and impact on the budget. Um, like I said, it's taken into consideration what the potential could be, um, but there's uncertainty around what that looks like and what that means going forward. Bridge funding is a significant one. Uh, in, if any increase is a reduction, so if any increase in funding is a reduction to our bridge funding, then really uh, we're not receiving any increases over time. We're just netting to zero. And so any future cost increases will continue to reduce uh, the programs that we offer or make it more challenging to offer the programs that we have. Um, the uncertainty altogether as to when, if or when we will lose the, the bridge funding is also a, a question that uh, comes to mind. And so those are some of the most significant finance, business and financial risks. And if, and if uh, any of you can think of additional ones that uh, I may, may not have uh, noted, uh, we can add that to the document that we send into Alberta Education. Um, but certainly those are the three uh, that I thought of uh, right off the bat in regards to um, business and financial risks. Any, that leads me to the, to the end. Is there any questions around um, those, the significant business and financial risks? And I'm at the end of the presentation as well. So um, if there's any questions at all, then, then certainly I'm more than willing to, to uh, answer them. The, the one thing I would say is that in this budget, um, staffing has been a priority to maintain staffing. Supports for schools has also been a priority and managing the requirement to build a budget that ensures we are within the appropriate amount of reserves, um, meaning under the maximum and over the minimum. And so that's been a challenging and part of this whole uh, budget process as well. But I'll just open it up to any anyone with additional questions that they might have. Thanks, Mr. Perry. Uh, we really appreciate you going through this uh, with us, but also all the work that you've put into it. Um, any trustees who will start with uh, Trustee Stangowitz, and then I'll just keep an eye out um, and we'll move through um, as, as you guys put up your hands. So we'll go ahead with Trustee Stangowitz um, and please feel free to turn your camera on when you're speaking. Thanks. I'm gonna stop sharing here. There we go. Oh, well, that's good. Then I can see everyone a little bit better. So if you guys wanna go ahead and turn your cameras back on, uh, just a reminder that this is a recorded meeting um, so the public can see it later and I'm sure they wanna see our bright faces. So go ahead, Trustee Stakelitz. Thank you, uh, Trustee Poitras and Mr. Perry. Uh, just for clarification on the last slide, uh, you talked about our bridge funding and, and a number that was reduced. And so it basically netted zero. If you could just clarify that for the public, um, just for a moment that we did receive bridge funding from the government for, from COVID and then our allocation was reduced. So yeah. they said they're giving us money, but they were teasing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we still have about $1.6 million in bridge funding, but we originally had over $2 million, just over $2 million. And so the, the increase in base funding and um, other areas that was provided to us was negated by the decrease to our bridge funding um, not entirely, but when you take into account capital maintenance renewal reduction, it really means that the overall funding that the jurisdiction is getting is zero or a slight, slight increase. Um, if you don't want to include capital maintenance renewal because it's a capital you know, reduction in that area, then there's just over $200,000 that uh, would have been received. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Yep, no problem. Mr. Perry, bridge funding was not originally introduced because of COVID-19, however, right? It was when we switched from the way that um, students were funded. Correct, yeah. They changed, the, they changed the framework to provide funding to jurisdictions. And uh, at that time, it was identified that based on this new funding formula, we were, the funding formula was 
$2 million less than what we were currently receiving and they held us harmless and called it bridge funding. And over the last couple of years, they've maintained the bridge funding and said, we will hold you harmless. Um, I did the research, looked up all the jurisdictions in the uh, province and they're all receiving bridge funding. So uh, the question is, will bridge funding continue? And if not, you know, when will we lose 1.6 you know, million dollars from our budget? And what impact will that have um, on, on the jurisdiction and our operations? So, so. Thank you for clearing that up. Um, I just wanna make sure that I had it right. There's so many different kinds of funding we've had over the last couple of years with COVID and um, the change. So uh, do we have other trustees who have questions and it's open up about any part of the budget? Also, if you've gone through the budget report, I mean, I, I went through the majority of the highlights, assumptions, and so forth, as well as the, um, you know, reasons for increases, decreases. But if there's anything in the budget, there's also, I'll just identify that there's also a, um, a fees section that gives more detail with regards to fees and uh, sales and services. Um, there's also what's called the accumulated operating surplus. Um, uh, spreadsheet um, that is the decreases and increases to our operating reserves which I went through kind of on a global scale with you um, there's also a detail with regards to where what we are spending on you know the deficits why why we need to go into a deficit and maybe I can just ex explain what that is real quick if I can jump to that what I've put down on the on the document um, so looking for a, okay, I'm going to have to read it sideways because I can't find the, uh, tab to rotate. Okay. So as part of the, the deficit, there is a, an amount of just over $70,000 that relates to the um, the ARO, which is the uh, um, asset retirement obligation uh, for capital assets. It really is, uh, it, it ends up being coming through as a deficit because we have to amortize um, the uh, asset and the liability that uh, relate to like asbestos in our schools. And so it, it really is an in and an out it ends up being a, coming through as a deficit, but then it's offset by a, another entry into invested in tangible capital assets. So it's really a zero impact on our bottom line uh, with regards to unrestricted net assets. Um, so some of the things that I've identified why we're going into a uh, deficit position are to maintain uh, higher levels of PUF pre-K supports and as well as ECSLS uh, learning services supports. Um, we received reduced funding, but we maintained um, some of the same levels of support in that area. And so that is uh, 80,000 and 153,000. Uh, maintain the pursuits program and place-based programming, which is just over a million dollars and maintaining um, increased uh, learning support staffing levels and divisional supports is about 603,000, which totals up to the the 1.956 million dollar deficit. So I see Carla has her hand up. So yeah, we got Carla and then Brad. Um, thank you for that, Jeff. Go ahead, yeah. Carla. Hi, thanks. I just wanted to say that it was very apparent in the budget and in conversations that this, the administration really wanted to maintain staffing levels. And I really appreciate the work that went into this budget to um, facilitate that, accommodate that, because um, I know it wasn't, it wasn't easy. So thank you for that. Thanks, Carla. Brad, you're up. Thank you. See if I can unmute myself without kicking myself out of the meeting again this time. Uh, 
appreciate the, the background. A lot of, uh, I know a lot of work has gone into this more than any other with everything that's going on externally this past year, uh, a lot of unknowns. Uh, you talked a bit about uh, the assumptions and uh, kind of what you're, you're basing this budget on. Just a uh, question, uh, what are, in general, kind of what are you, is there a number that you're basing uh, your assumptions on uh, in, for example, like uh, estimating inflation, something that's general overarching over, over all of that? Is there a number that you're estimating for inflation for the upcoming year? When I think of inflation, I think specifically of individual areas um, that might be impacted by that. Um, typically, any I don't have a number for inflation per se, but the areas of uh, um, higher utilities, higher fuel, and things of that nature are obviously demonstrations that it's even more than a percentage because those areas increase significantly more. Uh, utilities over this over the current year have increased such that we're almost, you know, 50 plus percent of uh, what we had budgeted in the current year, we have to add to, to the uh, uh, budget. So I don't have a, a inflation percentage per se, but we look at each of the areas. Um, we know that there's increases. We also know that PD can be done online. You know, there's not as much travel for meetings because we can meet online. So there's areas where we have reduced um, but uh, when I think of cost increases or decreases, it's really specifically on the on the those individual items, and schools have to take that into consideration when they schools and departments have to take that into consideration when they uh, review their budgets as far as what uh, uh, how far those dollars will go based on what they know, and so uh, everybody takes that into consideration as they're going. But certainly, we know that inflation continues to rise. That's why in the significant business risks area, you know, identified, you know, what additional items um, will be impacted significantly. Um, I don't think any of us anticipated that fuel would go up to the rate that it's at in the short term, but it has. So I don't know if that answers your, your question, Brad, but that's, you know, it's more yeah. specific. Yeah, no, for sure. Just didn't know if there was an overarching number that we were estimating a thread throughout for a just general inflation. Um, another question would be, uh, do you feel that we are conservative in our uh, projection for student enrollment that goes into that weighted moving average? Good question. Um, I, I think we've been optimistic, actually. In, in many years, we've been overly conservative. And that's not been real beneficial to us. So I think we've been optimistic, but real, realistic with regards to the numbers that will come for next year. And uh, there's always the year. One of the most challenging is the, um, and, and we've always been really conservative in the area of, of ECS students, so kindergarten students. And uh, so we, we looked at, you know, over the last three years, where have we been and uh, adjusted our, our ECS numbers to be consistent with that. We could find a year where we're down uh, more significantly than we anticipated. Um, you know, um, there's there's other areas that we could spend more money and more time into evaluating that, but history identifies that we're pretty close based on 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 history. So um, I would say we're we're conservative, but but somewhat more optimistic than we have been in the past. No, I uh, appreciate that. And if, if I could, Madam Chair, just one more question. Uh, I know the pandemic has made it uh, challenging the past few years to really make accurate predictions. Like you say, the fuel and, and things continue to rise and a lot of external factors going on. But uh, in a, as I've been a trustee, we've, we've made plans for deficit budgets before and we haven't been able to achieve those. And we know with the government uh, having eyes on uh, surpluses for school uh, divisions. It's something that's uh, on their radar and uh, setting those targets, like you say, the minimum and maximum for us to shoot for. Uh, the question would be what new measures are, are going into place uh, this year to help us uh, achieve this going forward? No, great question, Brad. Um, yeah, it, it's very true. Um, given the fact that some of our budgets have shrunk, 
uh, with regards to reductions, you know, outside of staffing costs, um, there, there's a less likelihood of uh, uh, realizing a surplus where we would have in the past, not as many areas to have a contingency built up in there. Um, some of the areas that could be challenging are, you know, is the average cost of a teacher increase or higher or lower? Um, but uh, I've mentioned this in the past and uh, monthly rigorous uh, monitoring of the uh, um, budget going forward. Um, we, we bring it to the board on a quarterly basis. We have the audit committee that looks at it, but um, more uh, uh, rig rigorous uh, uh, monitoring of the budget on a monthly basis is something that has, will be implemented in the following year to ensure that we know where we're at and what impact that might have on, on the jurisdiction to ensure that uh, um, we are within the appropriate level of reserves at the end of the day. Um, and so that information will, will be brought back to the board uh, uh, more regularly, but uh, you know, just as far as information and then a more thorough review on the quarterly reporting by the audit committee. But uh, um, that's, that's what we've planned anyways. Thank you so much for your questions, trustee Toon. Um, we appreciate that uh, and for your answers, Mr. Carey. Uh, we'll go to trustee Yegas now. Um, there was a mention, you mentioned about the, um, the amount of uh, revenue that's going to be going back to the schools for their operational you know, supplies and everything else. And I was just wondering, is this going to be sufficient with the new curriculum coming in? Or, or, or are we gonna have schools that might be having to, to look at uh, uh, for the resources that are going to be needed uh, for this? Has there been any, any way that this has been estimated or is this, they're all gonna to have to just take it and do with what they can with what they have? Well, that's a good question. Uh, so we, we have received uh, funding from the provincial government for the curriculum implementation to uh, purchase um, supplies uh, for the uh, various grade levels that are receiving the curriculum um, uh, change. And so that will be, uh, currently Chad is responsible for that area and he'll, he'll uh, identify where the need is and what uh, needs to be purchased. And, and so we have the resources to put into, into those areas. So uh, it would likely not be expected for them to use their current budget to try and, and get all the materials that they would need for a new curriculum implementation. And I, I guess my question then would go on is, uh, <laughs> I guess we can't see into the future, but you know, next year they plan on bringing in more, so uh, uh, more curriculum. So uh, has there been any kind of, of, has there been any way that this budget or the budgets will be to help offset this, this cost to the schools? Yeah, so those, those resources that we're receiving are going directly to offset those costs. So schools would have not be required to uh, uh, add the additional costs of curriculum implementation while we receive resources to, to put in that area. So that's the plan for this upcoming year anyways. Thank you. Trustee Long, did you have any questions or comments about the budget at this point? No? Okay. Um, Mr. Perry, as our administrators have said that, you know, staffing, staffing, staffing is the number one priority, which obviously means kids are the number one priority because we want to ensure that we have enough staff, um, all staff to keep our schools safe and caring and our students um, getting the attention they need. With this current budget, are our class sizes being affected at all in order to accommodate the budget? Um, or will we continue to maintain relatively similar class sizes that we've had in the past at this point um, and still be able to afford to um, have enough staff uh, to keep the, the classroom levels at a smaller number as we have? Yeah. So the level of the level of staffing has 
increased and not decreased our allocation, initial allocation for um, uh, certificated teachers uh, takes into consideration the um, ACOL recommendations, which were given quite some time ago, uh, but it provides um, staffing based on those numbers. So we take into consideration what the enrollment is out of the school and uh, what the recommendations were with regards to class size. And so that's taken into consideration in the allocations. And then we look at contextual information. It doesn't mean that there won't be any classes that are over that threshold, but from on a divisional basis, um, we should have the ability to meet. It really depends on what the school principal does out at the school level. They may do things that increase the class size so that they can uh, have other supports in, in other areas. But the allocation that goes out to the schools does take that into consideration. Perfect. Yeah, I know it does. And there's always those one classes that are so big or so small and um, that it does lie with the principal, which is excellent because they know what they need best. But um, it's nice to hear that we haven't um, needed to kind of claw back funding and, and limit what they're asking for as far as uh, certificated staff and, and other staff. So uh, thanks for that. I think um, I think we have all had a chance. I'm just going to give the trustees one second here, see if anyone else has any other questions or clarifying questions before we approve this budget. Okay, Brad, go ahead. I'm sorry, trustee Toon, uh, go ahead. Sorry, I apologize about that. Uh, just uh, a, a question as we approve uh, this budget, it gets us well under uh, the uh, maximum for uh, surplus dollars that uh, has been set out for the government. Uh, as we know, we're gonna have challenges going forward if there isn't uh, any significant changes in the funding formula. Uh, we've talked about it before, the reductions in, in funding that, that will be realized. As, as we approve this budget and look onto the horizon, what are some things that are uh, gonna be um, processes that are gonna be in place to the, discuss that budgeting going forward, just in cognizance. I know that's kind of uh, a little bit down the road and we, we've been focused on approving this budget, but just as we approve this one, uh, what are some things that we can look forward to uh, discussing with stakeholders going forward to, to, dis to discuss uh, how decisions will be made and for the yeah no i can appreciate that thanks brad for the 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 question internally i mean the the board has the ability to go to stakeholders and present potentially like they did in the past with regards to what they prioritize what's important you know providing contextual information to them and allowing them to respond is is likely a good idea and it's probably uh, a, a good process to go through internally uh, we continue to evaluate areas that we might have the ability to save uh, funds. Um, we also continue to petition the government to um, uh, provide uh, more clarity around the bridge funding side of things. Uh, you know, when we can anticipate that, uh, you know, whether that's a, more of an immediate uh, requirement that we need to, to deal with or whether there uh, is likely uh, the ability to maintain those dollars going in the short term. Um, however, we know it's typically year to year that we receive information. So um, we did look at a process last year, a process uh, um, with regards to internally uh, looking at how we could, could uh, develop a, a plan going forward. And, and that's still in the works with regards to how we go about that. Um, but uh, uh, certainly within internally, we're... Um, contemplating and looking at ways that we can reduce costs without impacting the classroom. Thank you so much. Um, I know that Trustee Stanglis has to go. Does anyone else have any questions or comments around the budget? Okay, so uh, Trustee Sandwich, I did see your message there, so we'll let you go. Um, sorry, she uh, she's got uh, to volunteer and uh, has a shift to make, so we'll let her go. But um, Trustee Toom, go ahead. 
Yeah, thanks. Not not a, a question so much as just a comment on what as others have said. I, I want to thank administration for their hard work and dedication with uh, creating this budget. Uh, there's been a lot of work and effort has been said to minimize the input impact on students and in the classroom and help support staff as much as possible. Uh, I know we've had some challenging times and I think our, our division's done a phenomenal job in making sure that uh, we have uh, all the resources available for, for students to succeed. And I, I see that again in this budget and uh, just wanna I thank uh, uh, Mr. Perry and our, our superintendent and all the staff for their, their amazing work on this and uh, really excited to our, this upcoming year to try and uh, see some more positive growth that we've seen uh, the last few years. Thanks, Brad. Thanks so much, Trustee Toon. Um, okay, so uh, we really, yeah, I want to thank uh, everyone who's worked on this budget, um, especially Mr. Perry, obviously has spent many hours. Um, and I want to thank all the trustees for uh, your questions and your insight and for taking the time to look into this budget before and come prepared to this meeting. I know that it's not easy when we get stuff last minute and Mr. Perry is right under a crunch as well. So I appreciate everyone's work um, and moving forward. We have some good plans, but our past shows that Livingston Range has always been um, collaborative and um, innovative. And so even though times are tight and we're hearing it from a lot of school divisions, I know that we will continue to, you know, blaze that trail and find the solutions that we need to find in order to keep those dollars in the classroom and, and not have our students affected. So um, I, I appreciate that. Um, so with that, I'm just going to read the recommendation one more time. Uh, this was made by uh, Trustee Yegos, and the recommendation is that the 2022-2023 budget for the Livingston Range School Division be approved by the Board of Trustees for submission to Alberta Education. Uh, before I call the question, I'm just gonna ask if Trustee Yegos wanted to close on this. I think Trustee Toon made a excellent closing statement and I don't can't add anything on, so you could put that as a ditto for me. Thank you. <laughs> Here, here. Okay, perfect. Then with that, we'll call the question. Um, I guess I have to read it. I'll read it one more time. That the 2022-2023 budget for the Livingston Range School Division be approved by the Board of Trustees for submission to Alberta Education. Are there any opposed? Seeing none, that is passed. Perfect, thank you so much. So, at 525, there's the recommendation that the Board of Trustees vote in favor of the meeting being adjourned at 525. Can I get someone to make that motion? Trustee Hodges. Okay, perfect. Uh, and thank you all so much for making the time uh, for this meeting today. And have a great evening. <laughs>